coming tonight. I know it's a Thursday. I know it's a midterms week, so it really means a lot that you all showed up. Um, we are Young Americans for Liberty. We're the Libertarians, Constitutionalists, Voluntarists, Classical Liberals on campus. And um, so it seems appropriate that I bring Dr. Sharon Rosie to campus to talk about setting up the authority because I believe it's relevant not only for our group, but for the events that have been happening in recent, like the Occupy movement. But about our speaker, uh, Dr. Sharon Presley has been a long time libertarian activist and writer. Um, she's actually receiving an award this Sunday at Libertopia. And um, she uh, has a PhD in social psychology where she with that she uh, obtained at the City University in New York. She studied under Dr. Stanley Milgram, whom some of you may know from uh, the Standing Up to Authority experiments done in the 50s. Um, she also as a, as a speaker for the Society or the Association of Libertarian Feminists and has in town for Libertopia and decided to come and speak for a group, which we are very honored to have her here. So I'd like to present to all Dr. Chairman. It is kind of a timely topic, isn't it? But actually what I'm going to talk about is, is on a more individual, practical level rather than on a political level. Because my book, Standing Up to Experts and Authority, is actually not a partisan political book. It's practical psychology. Now, let me ask you, anybody here, is there anybody here who's never had a problem with authority? Uh, yeah, see, it's a trick question because we know the answer, of course. Now, I want to start by giving you an anecdote um, that uh, illustrates an important point that I make in the book. Actually, two anecdotes. A one, uh, and, and by the way, all of the stories in my book are two. I didn't make any of them up. The one that's hypothetical, I labeled. The rest are all based on experiences of real people. Some of them are mine, carefully disguised, and, uh, but many are based on other people's experiences with authority. So the book is a combination of practical psychology, straight out of the psychology literature, and uh, the experience of people uh, that have worked, things that have worked for people. Now, well, I have uh, had a student who told me this story. Her, her grandmother had had a foot problem, and it kept getting, even though she went to the doctor, it kept getting worse. So instead of, as we see in, in retrospect, instead of questioning the doctor and trying to go find another doctor, uh, she just let it go. And finally, she had to take uh, uh, the grandmother to the emergency room where they, the original doctor had diagnosed it as an athlete's foot. And I, when listening to the symptoms, I thought, how in the world did he do that? Because I'm not a medical doctor. I am a doctor, but I'm not a medical doctor. And it sounded like diabetes to me, and which is exactly what it was. But by the time she went to the emergency room, she had to have her toe amputated. And what that illustrates the grandmother didn't know that she had the power to do something about the situation. And the kinds of things she could have done, I'm going to talk about in my talk. So she didn't know she had the power to question and to look elsewhere for information. Because a lot of people think if the doctor says it, it must be so, and they never question it. The other example um, is one where someone did know they had the power. Adela got stopped by the police for driving with an expired license plate. But it wasn't her car, it belonged to a friend of hers. And so she told the friend about it, the friend said, oh, I'll take care of it. Well, the friend didn't, kind of flaked off. And so six months later, this warrant arrives in the mail, uh, threatening Adela with you know, a huge fine. So she went to court and she decided to, to question the ticket or challenge it. Now, when she first got to the court, the clerk of the court, the first uh, echelon of bureaucracy, said, oh, the judge will be very mad at you if you uh, continue this. She just should pay your fine and be done with it. Well, she knew better. She says, no, I want to be heard by a judge. Because what she knew 
the higher up the hierarchy, the more decision-making power the person has. So she went before the judge and she said, the reason that I forgot to respond to this notice was uh, that I was being, uh, I had a, a, some deadlines, some very important deadlines working on uh, my, my dissertation, and I, I was under a lot of stress. Here's the important part, because she had a piece of paper from her physician saying she was being treated by, for a stress-related condition. Case dismissed. She knew she had the power to question, and she knew that something on paper from another authority would carry a lot more weight than her pitiful complaint. Okay, case dismissed, no fine, nothing. She knew she had the power to do something about her situation. Now when we use the word power, there are two kinds of power. Power over others, which libertarians of course are against, and power over yourself. That's the kind of power I'm talking about tonight. You don't have to be a victim. The key is to understand how your power gets taken away from you. And it isn't necessarily through deliberate intent on the part of the experts and authorities, although that certainly can happen. But, but there are many factors that people are unaware of that can affect your willingness to obey uh, authority or to go along with experts. Has any of you read about the Milgram experiment? No. Now, a lot of libertarians imagine they don't need to know about authority. They already know about authority. Well, yeah, you know, political authority. But unless you're a social psychologist, you don't know a lot of the stuff that's in the book. I did a lot of research for the book. And even I learn things. And let me tell you, I know a lot about authority. So what you don't know can take your power away. Um, now, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, bit in general. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the principles that will help you stand up to experts and authorities. And then if we have time, I'll, get, I'll talk about some specific situations. It's all there briefly on your outline. Now, in so social psychology, we know that the situation you're in can often have an effect on what you do. It had a tremendous impact in the Milgram experiment. How many of you are familiar with the Milgram experiment? Okay. Uh, as uh, many of you may know, in a, under the pressure to conform to the experiment, 65% of the people Said, went along with the experimenter, even when the guy in the other room was saying, stop, stop, I want you to stop, and so forth. Okay. I, the factors that are in the situation affect our behavior, and particularly in this regard with authority, I call the seduction of the situation. Factors in the situation that unconsciously affect you and make you less likely to stand up for yourself. Uh, but I will add parenthetically that uh, there are personal factors that affect resistance to authority. And you can, I'll maybe talk about that later. Um, another kind of thing that social psychologists talk about is unconscious scripts. Well, that's one of the ways we talk about what affects people in everyday life. Unconscious uh, scripts of power, that is, uh, uh, how we should interact with uh, experts and authorities. And we don't even realize those. Because, for instance, there's a, a script for how students and professors interact. Uh, and, and many of us go along with that, or especially in, in a high school, a grade school level, you know, often the script is you don't question the teacher. So what I, what I do in my book is talk about the factors and that, that and because if you know about them, then you become more aware of them and they won't have the same impact. And then I show you how to prepare yourself uh, both psychologically um, and practically to cope with authority. 
And uh, I also, in the book, and I hopefully I'll say a little tonight, about specific situations in which authorities or experts can bamboozle you, including schools, have a whole chapter on education, want to know how to question uh, a grade your teacher has given you? It's in the book, okay. Uh, so, uh, and I, I have uh, chapters about the workplace, dealing with bosses, uh, I have a chapter on the media, how to uh, think critically about the media. I have a chapter on uh, that's called Don't Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. And it's about physicians, psychologists, and psychiatrists. And so on. So I have, it's a very practical book. Now, I want to talk about some of the techniques that can pretty much work in almost any kind of situation that you may encounter an authority or expert. By the way, let me make a differentiation. There's a lot of people who use the term interchangeably. I do not. The reason why I keep using both terms. An expert is somebody who has particular knowledge in a particular area. You can choose to go along with your advice or not. An authority is someone who has power over you in a situation. And if you are in that system, you have no choice. So there is a difference. The terms are, in my view, not interchangeable. Um, so government is the clearest authority that we're up against, though certainly not the only one. You can, you can voluntarily choose to be part of an authority system, like a church or the mafia or something like that. But once you are in the system, you have to go along. With experts, you have a choice. So that's the difference. The first step. Understand that you have a right to question. Now, I'm guessing that in a libertarian group, that one is pretty clear to you, that you don't have a big problem with that. But let me tell you, a lot of people do. And for instance, the example I gave of, of Rose's grandmother. She didn't know she had a right to question. OK, so the second one is be prepared. Uh, search out facts or information about the issue or problem that you want to bring up with the expert. This would have helped Rosa and her grandmother if they'd done a search on her symptoms on the internet. They would have found out pretty quickly that the symptoms matched diabetes a great deal more than Abbott's foot. I have no idea why the doctor thought it was Abbott's foot. You know, the symptoms were clearly diabetes. So, <clears throat> Let me give you an example of someone who did that. Joyce um, had a pituitary tumor removed. And afterwards, you know, this was, as brain surgery goes, this is fairly minor. <clears throat> but what she, she realized, that she was very weak. She was having trouble walking. Well, that's not a side effect of, brain, of, of having the pituitary tumor removed. So she did a little research on the internet and discovered that the drug that she had given for information after the operation, one of the side effects was lower body weakness. So armed with that information, she went to her physician and said, I don't want to take this stuff anymore. Give me something else. And so that, because she did her homework, pardon the expression, she was able to have an intelligent conversation with the doctor about what her treatment should be. And this is, this is something that, that applies across the board. Uh, if you're going to see a lawyer, a contractor, whatever it might be, do your homework ahead of time to learn more about the situation and what might be appropriate. If you have to make a request of a government official, and let's face it, folks, that will happen sometime in your life unless you live in a cave, um, look up the relevant rules and regulations. A lot of these are posted on the internet. You get the idea. And probably many of you would be inclined to do that. But it's really very important because then when you go to talk to the authority or expert, they'll, they'll see that you know something about it. They will treat you more seriously because you know something about it and you didn't come in with just knowing nothing. 
uh, when you're out in the uh, hard world of reality and working for uh, someone, want to know about a raise, you look it up on the internet, find out what people are getting that, that particular position. So I met, I think that most of you probably are pretty good with searches. You have to be a student these days, and you probably know how to look at stuff on the internet, so I don't think I need to dwell on that too long. But do keep in mind that librarians can help you. You all know that. Librarians do tremendous research, whether on campus or in the public library, because they know how to do searches on particular issues. They're a wonderful resource. So knowledge is power. If you get, be prepared for your encounter with authority, you will ask better and more informed questions. And as I said, by presenting yourself as a knowledgeable person rather than a supplicant, you'll get more respect from the authority and more, be more likely to get what you need. The third thing, have a list of questions. What are the pros and cons of each alternative? How long will it take to implement the advice? How long will it take for the approach to be effective? Whatever might be appropriate. Have a list of specific questions to ask the expert. What are the long-term implications? See, these, these are all useful if you're going to a physician to talk about the course of treatment. Don't just say, oh, okay, they hand you a prescription and then you take it. You, you do research. And the importance of writing it out, your mind won't go blank when you're confronted with the expert. A lot of people have that problem. And so writing out the questions ahead of time is important. Here's a, a quote from a student of mine, Paulina. She was a very shy person who got flustered easily. But she knew I was writing this book, so she talked to me and actually asked my advice about a particular situation. And I'm happy to report that my advice helped her <laughs> tremendously. Um, but um, her, what had happened is her, her boss invited her for dinner uh, with some other people. And she was a vegetarian. And she told him that ahead of time. But this guy was a little clueless on the concept of vegetarian. And there were no, in every dish had meat in it. So she didn't eat anything. Of course, he was very offended, thought there was something wrong with her. So she asked him what to do about it. And so I told her, first of all, write down your issues and then you know, talk to him about it. And the other thing I did, I'm going to tell you about later on. Um, so she said, the first thing I did was write down everything I felt was important to mention to my boss. At times, I can get really nervous. I often forget what I want to say, and, and other things I do say, it usually doesn't make sense, or I forget important details. Writing everything down was very helpful in this situation. By doing so, I didn't leave any important information out, and the discussion matter was thoughtful and organized. On my sheet of paper, I also wrote down uh, all the, the uh, times I wanted to, to show, uh, wrote down the times I wanted to show my boss the internet articles. This uh, way I could remember to show him the articles that corresponded with what I was explaining. And I, because the other thing I told her to do besides writing everything down actually was find some articles on the internet that pointed out that vegetarians who eat meat sometimes get sick. And that, that turned out to be the key thing that got the boss stopped being mad at her. A list is like having an ally with you. It supports you and backs you up. Another important thing to do is put it in writing. And I don't, in this case, I don't mean put, uh, having a list of questions. A written document is more powerful than verbal descriptions. For example, if you're being harassed at work, write, you keep track of the particulars with a notebook. What, what time, what the person said, whether anybody was watching. And of course, the story I told at the beginning was another example of that. Adela brought in the note from her doctor, okay? 
So these, this very important piece of a written document has more power than just saying it uh, orally. Here's another um, example of a high school teacher who anticipated uh, a problem. She had occasionally run into the problem of parents who lied to the administration about when the, the, the Consuelo would talk with the um, student and say, you should do this, this, and this. And then the student, then the next thing she knew, the parents were complaining, you never talked to my my, my son or daughter. So she got tired of that. She says after several similar incidents, Consuelo learned to document everything and record all the conferences so that the parents couldn't come back and lie or the student lie. So you have to think about what kind of document might be helpful. Get a, get a traffic ticket. I have a whole section on how to beat a traffic ticket. Actually, if you look or search online, you can actually find a lot of information. It seems like a popular topic. Think about what might be necessary. You've got a cell, a cell phone that takes photographs. Take a picture of, of this situation to back you up when you come up, when you uh, want to question it with whatever excuse is appropriate. So examples of documentation can include photos, videos, signed affidavits, witness statements, police or medical records, or even relevant expert literature. Okay, so again, having intelligent questions or written documentation will make you feel more self-confident and more powerful. And the feeling of self-confidence it's an important aspect of the next step that I'm going to suggest. Psych yourself up. Mental preparation. Your mental status is important. That's one thing we clearly know in psychology. If the person you are facing or talking to picks up on fear and uncertainty, you're in a power down position. If you go in with mental hat in hand, with an ear of air of timidity, oh, can you please change my grade, professor? No, no, that's not going to work. Uh, you have to. You've already defeated yourself if you go in with this air, th that kind of uh, air. So what you have to do is go on the offensive, not the defensive. And by offensive, I don't mean aggressive offensive. Aggression won't help you dealing with authority. It'll just piss them off. That, that's not what you want to do. But by going on the offensive, you act like, of course you should agree with what I'm suggesting. Again, not arrogantly, but just confidently. Fake it till you make it. You may have heard that phrase before. It sounds psychological advice in this context. Because even if you don't feel self-confident, if you act self-confident, it can create a self-fulfilling prophecy. You'll actually end up feeling more self-confident. So it's important to psych yourself up. OK, the next point, questions to be answered. Tell the authority or expert how many questions you'd like to have answered. Uh, ask how much time can be spent or set aside. If it's not enough time, ask for more time or another uh, appointment. This is helpful with bosses, doctors, lawyers, government officials, teachers. Confirming these details at the beginning is setting the agenda. By taking the initiative to set the agenda, you have control. And you have created a better balance of power. This gives you an advantage. OK? So you're not going to go in there like a supplicant. You're going to go in there like that person's equal. You're going to have an equal give and take. Unless the uh, expert has an ego the size of the state of Texas, that wouldn't usually help. <clears throat> take notes. 
You all know about taking notes. You hopefully are pretty good at that by now. Take a notebook with you. As your authority or expert speaks, take careful notes. This can increase your critical thinking as well as theirs. However, with this one, you have to be careful. If the person, the authority gets defensive, then you can't do that. You have to play it by ear on that. So what you then have to do is pay attention and try to remember the details of what was said. The expert has less power over you when you're taking notes because, first of all, not only will you be more attentive to cues um, in a situation while you're taking notes, the act of writing puts you on a more equal give and take uh, with the uh, expert. Again, you, this makes you an active participant rather than a passive supplicant. Now let me talk about some of the nonverbal cues that you have to watch out for in a situation. Remember I said that in this, there are often many factors in a situation that you might not think about that actually can have a tremendous impact. There's actually in the Milgram experiment, there were actually 18 different variations where all Milgram did was change one factor in the situation. And, we, and he saw a tremendous range in the rate of obedience to the original instructions. And people didn't know that those factors were affecting them, but they, but they did. So let's, uh, I'm going to briefly discuss some of uh, the nonverbal cues. First of all, watch out for the symbols of authority. Don't be seduced by them. For instance, the way people dress. Um, I had a student who took a, a seminar that I gave on the individual and authority many years ago, and he was so impressed by what he heard, not, not me so much as the, the research that I reported, that he went out and did his own experiment, and, it was a, and he later went on to have a highly prestigious career in social psychology, by the way. His name is Brad Bushman. He's got a textbook out. But his first experiment was based on my discussion of a study that had been done called The Power of a Uniform. And let me tell you about it. I was actually a, one of Milton's graduate students, as I recall. He went out on the streets of Brooklyn. There was a car that was parked at an expired meter. And as people would walk down the street, he would walk up to them and say, the meter's expired. Would you put some money in the meter? tell you in New York City, this was a peculiar request. But leaving that aside, what he varied was what he was wearing when he made the request. One time he was just wearing ordinary clothes. Another time he was wearing a private guard's uniform that looked a lot like the NYPD. The third situation, he was wearing a milkman's white uniform. Now, you're all too young to remember when dairies would actually deliver bottles of milk to your doorstep. Okay. This was done a while ago. Okay. Now, you could, uh, now then he re measured the rate of compliance with the instructions to put money in the expired meter. Now, you won't be surprised when I tell you that he got a greater rate of compliance when he was wearing the guard's uniform than with the ordinary clothes. The real surprise is he got a higher rate of compliance when he was wearing the milkman's uniform. Now tell me, what does a milkman have to do with authority? Zip, okay? Uniforms have a power. And so my uh, uh, student, Brad Bushman, did a study where uh, they, he, one of the situations was the fellow making a request was wearing a business suit. Another situation wearing uh, a firefighter's uniform. And the third one kind of scruffy clothes. And he got a greater rate of compliance with the business suit as well as the firefighter's uniform. However, in his second experiment, he used gender as a variable. And when the woman was wearing a business suit, it didn't make any difference. The only time they got a higher rate of